Hello and welcome to Brand Awareness episode 7. I'm Brenda Vaisha, your host. If you're watching this video and not just listening, I'm set up at my like dining table in my house in Berlin. It's just giving my like, parent teacher conference. Am I intimidating? If I feel like I'm about to give you a lecture. Maybe this isn't the most casual setting, but we're just gonna go with it. I'm gonna have one sip of water, one second. Mm. I took a 10 day hiatus, 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 and I am home in Berlin. We're in my, I have like a living dining room situation set up. I don't know, do you care about my furniture? The glass you're seeing is Itala. I also have the, it's Alva Alto, right? The vase, I have a lot of Itala in my house. And my chairs, they look very uncomfortable, but I swear they're not bad, is they are Mario Botta. I got them from, I have four, I'm planning to get six, but by now they're super expensive. Um, I got them on eBay Kleinanzeigen, which is like a local eBay, and I highly suggest getting on there if you're based in Germany, and especially if you're not in a city. You can, you, I mean, you just have to know what you're looking for, but... Imagine you're browsing on first dibs, you're saving all of the things that you like that are way too expensive. Uh, the fear of not having press play on the video is now hitting me, so I have to get up and check. I don't know why this always happens to me. It's very like, did I turn the stove off before I left the house? Apparently, it's recording, so let's see. Um, eBay and saying, and you go on the vendors that are really expensive on first dibs or in Europe there's Pamono, I think. I don't know if they're still around. And then, or you're just on Pinterest and then you save the designers and then you type them into eBay Kleinanzeigen and sometimes you get really lucky. So I drove with my mini um, a few years ago through Berlin and collected them from actually four different sellers, I think, uh, three different sellers. I think one sold me two pairs. Anyways, Mario Botta. And then my table is custom, a friend of mine that does furniture. I just wanted something skinny that you can see underneath because I think it always, I have a really big space, but it sucks up a lot of light at a table. So I wanted the legs to be really skinny so that everything um, that you can see more. And it's just wood and then they painted it, he painted it matte black. And I think that's all you can see. I'm wearing um, John Galliano Dior. I don't know if I've had like gigantic logo on the podcast. I'm wearing a really big Jador Dior job. It's laundry day. This is what I had um, lying around. I'm wearing a Rick Owens, what's the model called? Um, well, silk pants that are super long. I cut them myself with my kitchen scissors, so they're really <laughs> ripped up. And then my trusted, the row, these like naked slippers. I wore the, the black version that is like more like a boot in the last episode. I don't know what they're called, but if you type in like the row mesh, is this a sandal, a ballerina? Uh, the row mesh flats, they will come up. They are very expensive for what they are, but what isn't at this point? Um, I think I paid, oh my God. I remember being like quite bamboozled in, in the shop in New York because well, in America, you see the pre-tax and then it always gets me in the end. So they're quite expensive, but I mean, I think they're great. And that is what I'm wearing. Um, I think I will dive into a little bit of a strategy episode today. I just, I feel like, I don't know, maybe I said this in the last episode, I hyped this topic up so much and now I'm like stage fright because <laughs> it's so gigantic. And I also think to some people, strategy comes naturally. So I find it hard to put things into words sometimes. So I am picking up little strategy topics one by one to not overwhelm myself or you. Um, you're going to think I'm crazy otherwise. But strategy is just my whole career. And I love talking about how other people strategize. I love sharing knowledge, all of that stuff. Um, I also, I feel like I shouldn't give disclaimers on my own podcast. But of course, everything is very me-centered because I work for myself and my experiences are my own. So I hope my fear of being, being perceived as like, oh my God, oh, she's talking about herself versus I'm giving knowledge. I hope that I'm giving knowledge outweighs my own fear of, wow, she's just talking about herself for an hour. But I am talking about my experiences and how I strategize. So 
I can't find any other way to do this. And that's the biggest ache, right? Like um, being self-conscious on your own podcast. I don't know why I'm doing that. Anyways, yeah, I'm home. I was just on a little tour. I was in Paris. Um, we're actually back in a little under three weeks for Men's and Couture. We're currently doing my like scheduling of which shows I'm going to. I can talk about this a little bit later in the episode. So that's going on. Um, and then I was in Rome for my man's birthday and I haven't been to Rome in five years. I don't know why, but I've never really had the reason to go. But why do you need a reason to go to Rome? I think it is probably the most beautiful city in Europe. Maybe for some people that's a little bit overrated because it's so cheesy because it's almost so beautiful that you're like, oh, how is this real? But it is so beautiful. To me, it's a Rome and Venice. Um, maybe Paris, I'm not romanticizing as much anymore because I am there so often. But Rome, I think in May and then October, it is so beautiful. I do not advise you go in the summer because everything good, you know, in Italy, everything shuts down in August and probably a little bit late July as well. The good stuff isn't open and you'll just be surrounded by tourists and you're hot and there's no AC. So if you're just now thinking, I should book a trip to Rome, just postpone it until October. But it's so beautiful. We've had such good food. Um, I will share a little like list of the places we went. I feel like I already did. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I don't really do lists, but if you follow me anywhere, I mostly post where I'm going. Not live posting. I'm, I'm very safety first. I never share my location, like the restaurant while I'm there. I always do it on the way home but I will share the places. Okay, um, strategy. <laughs> it is obviously such a big topic and I feel like for today, also I should check the time. Maybe I've been, I've been talking for five minutes, right? Um, I will talk a little bit about my job, my setup, how I make money, and we'll talk about influence and how, to make, how I make money from that. I think some things will be quite obvious to you and some things aren't. When I was growing up, being an influencer was not a job. And I hope that you, with anyone that you're listening to that's speaking about their career, whether that's the most inspiring TED talk about a professor or it's like a little influencer like me talking about her job, I hope you go into career choices if you have the privilege to do that. Um, I don't think I have to mention that I'm privileged anymore. I think that's quite obvious. If you have the pr privilege to choose your own career, um, I hope you go into anything, whether that's education or if you want to be self-employed, your dream job might not be out there yet, you know, and everything that I'm doing didn't exist and the influencer turned writer didn't really exist. So I hope you take that into account that if you can't find exactly what you want to do, it really might not exist yet and you might be able to create it. Um, I just, I don't know if you guys are reading Brenda's business, but it's my column on o32c.com. It's um, once or twice a month I interview someone. Also, someone was asking me for the criteria on who I picked to be on Brenda's business. Uh, someone that built something for themselves or within a structure, it doesn't really matter, but I want to interview successful people because I think success stories are not only inspiring, but if the people are willing to get, get to give knowledge, they're helpful. Anyways, my latest one was Youssef Marquis, and I highly, 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 not to plug myself, but you know, it's my own podcast, highly recommend you reading it because this man's career did not exist. And um, he, I mean, <laughs> I'm getting goosebumps, but it's like such an inspiring career to me that he's talking about. And he is in communications and media and celebrity. And he went to Givenchy and the Ricardo Tichy. I think they were four people in the communications team or three or four, including him. I don't quite know, very little. And by the time he left as communications director, there were 60. Like you can create your own world. And I highly suggest you read the interview because I find it so inspiring. And um, it's one of those jobs where you don't really fully understand what they're doing, but it's out there. Um, yeah, anyways, my own setup. I think, yeah, I want to talk about influencing. I hope that it isn't the goal career for anyone that's listening to because um, influencer quite like modeling sometimes it's not that stimulating but I think with any career that you're doing if you're you know dreaming of having your own bakery shop I don't know even I don't have any examples but if you want to do something 
on your own, having a platform can always be beneficial. So I hope um, these things can be helpful. Oh my God, I'm so like self-aware of my mouth noises now. Um, okay, influencer work. I have like a list in front of myself. Also, okay, I am a big moleskin girl, the very expensive, I think very expensive um, notebooks, the leather notebooks. I just found an old one because mine are all in different handbags. And do you ever open your old notebooks and you're like, what the fuck was I talking about? Like, I have the weirdest, like, lists in here. What, like, just to open one thing, sorry, this wasn't planned either. Customer profiles, Asia, EU, US, VIP, industry taste maker, early adapter, commercial client. What am I talking about? Anyways, my old notebooks are a world on its own. Okay, influencing work, I think I'm gonna try and break down what I get paid for, what I can get paid for, and I will be missing out a lot of things because my job is very, 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 very hyper-specific within a niche sector of a niche industry, so not everything might... Anyways, um, how I get paid. Obviously, I think I already mentioned in the last episode, you can't just ask me what do you get paid for a post because it really varies. There's things you do for free and there's things you are like, this is 50K or nothing. I'm just making up numbers also. But what I get paid for is usually payment for posts. Um, and that can include a lot, of, a lot of other deliverables, whether I always write my own caption. You can't really dictate that as a client. But, you know, for some other influencers, um, it might be, here is the perfect good American jeans that uh, stretches according to your life phases. <laughs> this is, I'm just making a bullshit, but uh, for some influencers, the brand or the agency, sometimes you work directly with a brand and sometimes you work with an agency that is working for the brand. Um, for some people, it, they just give you the caption. I don't work like this, but that is an option. Um, hashtags also usually cost extra but like these things always vary in the bundle of whatever my I will also address my management but um, so there's payment for post caption hashtags then obviously if I'm talking about Instagram there's Instagram stories then there's Instagram stories with a, with a um, at like at the brand there's Instagram stories with hashtags and then there's Instagram stories with link to action call to action that's a link the link might be um, for signups like to a newsletter to a app app downloads these are all things like trackable things i will get to later but links are kind of like call to action so there are different kinds of jobs obviously mm, jobs for image you know someone is like i can afford brenda or they view me as um, exclusive um, there is awareness like um, this bag new bag of Prada exists that's a, that's raising awareness right like it's a bag activation and all these influencers post it at the same time like the new Prada Galleria bag that is um, awareness about the product um, then there's yeah call to action which is um, sign ups to an app sign ups to a program if you are um, Klarna or what all of these things are called right the pay later situations um, they might work with influencers with signups, like they want to track how many people actually sign up to make an account at Klarna. What's 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 it called in the U.S.? Uh, these like pay later like uh, setups. Um, then there is sale conversion. You know, this might be usually that I would say this is with cheaper products, not just like the Prada bag, because it's quite hard to measure this stuff. Because people might go into the store and not buy it online. Um, so that might be, um, I don't know, Mango and a big girl is posting on her story. Here's my outfit and here's the link to the pants. And it's an affiliate link, you know, affiliate links with, with cookies that track um, whoever is driving these sales. And then also with certain collaborations, uh, with cer certain activations, the influencer might also, besides getting paid, also get commission on sales. So those are the kind of um, the kind of setup that people get paid for. I'm trying to think of many more because I just wrote, I do my notes like five minutes before I do the podcast. I didn't even know what I was going to talk about. But these are kind of things um, that you can get paid for. You can get paid for appearances. Appearance sounds like I'm a celebrity, but you do, um, you are able to get paid for attending a brand dinner. If it's pretty commercial, you can be paid for attending a fashion show. You can be paid to attend a party. 
um, the setup for a party, for example, would be um, I get an invite, I, 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 or my management gets an invite for a party. The management, my management will ask, is there an attendance fee? That's called attendance fee. Or is there budget for an attendance fee? Also, I'm making this up. I have no idea. I'm never in the emails of my management, so I don't know the wordings that they use. And if the brand says yes, then uh, we, they might give an amount. And then it might be in the clause that uh, Brenda is at the party 30 minutes. Uh, Brenda will have a photo call, you know, in the photo wall to get the um, BFA or Getty images because that is worth something to the brand. So there are all these different um, deliverables. Uh, sometimes it's also not payment, but for example, a celebrity might not get paid to attend the show, but then there's different ways around it, right? Asking for travel to be covered, asking for hotel to be covered, asking for a car to the airport, from the airport to the show, from the show, asking for hair and makeup artist, um, asking for the outfit, asking maybe even to be gifted the outfit. Like there's always, um, sometimes there's not money in um, exchange for posts, but there's different, other different things. I usually would say I don't really work for travel, free travel, because it's still work. Um, yeah, getting your picture taken. Then there's also payment for producing content for a brand that you don't post yourself. For example, I have shot TikTok videos that I don't post myself, but I create content for the brand to post. And then there's also other uh, buyouts as in like Brenda has to repost it or if it's buyouts of three months or it's uh, content for a newsletter. So there's all of these different ways to make money. It's not just payment for posts. There are a bunch of different categories and I'm sure I'm missing so many, but there's the tag, there's the mention, there's the caption, there's the whatever. So there's a bunch of different ways to make money. Um, I... If I talk about my own so so social media strategy, what social media am I on? I am on Instagram, which I would say is my main social media. Um, I try, I, I, I would like to say I don't have a strategy, but of course everyone does. I would say it's very fun for me. I love content and I love posting and I love creating content. My content is not high quality content. Everything's iPhone picture, nothing's edited. So you don't pay for a lot of quality, I would say, but you pay for me, you know, and I'm in a very unique position. But my strategy, um, things that belong in the, in like under strategy, for example, which I love doing, but I try to reply to every single Instagram comment. I try to repost if you're sharing something about me. I try to be interactive. And I know that the term for this is called quote unquote community management. I don't feel like I am managing or controlling my community in any way. But to me, it is very obvious that I should reward someone that's interacting with my content, right? Um, if you get a re reply, of course, you are more inclined to... Um, leave another comment on my next post or one after. I, I think it's called social media for a reason. So I don't want to be, you know, there's influencers, mostly celebrities, but I know influencers whose assistant or management is signed into their account and they post and the influencer is never even on the account, you know. The management or assistant manage, manager is replying to the comments, is, you know, interacting with everyone on their behalf. I would personally never do that. And I also think you can always tell um, which influencer, not, there's nothing bad about it, but is in an engagement group with other influencers. You know, they're all like commenting under each other's posts. You can also tell when it's kind of spam comments. Um, I would certainly, like, I would not like to just have like emojis under my comment section. You know, I, I want full sentences. I want jokes. I want to be interactive. Um, so part of my um, content strategy, so to say, you know, I love writing, I love words, I love jokes. Um, I don't pre-plan my captions, but as I'm uploading, I like to always think of something that is interactive. And I think that should be an obvious thing to do. You know, um, if there is the photo dump and your caption is Sunday fun day, that is 
not engaging, you know, like no one cares. <laughs> so I try to have things interactive, but I do want to say that this, these things come naturally to me and I think everyone can also find their own. You don't have to force yourself to a funny caption. I think everyone can kind of find their own way when it comes to this. Um, then I think there's two different approaches and I think that also separates the tastemaker from someone who's just an adapter, even though it's an early adapter. I don't know if you've done, I've done um, business in the, my business class in high school. So there's like the tastemaker, there's the adapter, there's the whatever, there's all of these different terms. But I try to not think about what does my audience want from me so often. Um, for example, one time I did think about what, what does my audience think want from me is the podcast I really you know there's supply and demand and I was I realized I don't speak enough and I could speak more often but when it comes to my social media strategy like posts I try not to think about what does my audience want from me because to me it's very clear it's like outfit posts get dressed with me it's uh, product links and I try to actually do less of that and dictate um, what my audience will want from me because I think that I don't know if I'm making sense with this but I think that is what makes a tastemaker as a tastemaker I don't have a saved folder of other Instagram girls in my saved images I have memes I have um, incredibly um, creative content but it has nothing to do with fashion you know in my saved folder it's memes and it might be a Va vase, you know, a design object. It might be something, a texture, but I think, not to really <laughs> make myself into this like creative director, but I think you either lead or you follow. And when you have all of these mood boards and stuff you want to recreate, and I know that there's um, big fashion influencers who just take jokes they saw on TikTok and recreate them, and then the real goes viral, but I don't know. I don't think that's what I want to do. So I think strategy-wise, there's also always, you can tell when when a content creator just gives the audience what they want. And I think you can tell when a content creator does whatever they want and the audience has to take it or leave it. And I hope I'm more in the second category. So I try not to look at what everyone else is doing. And also strategy-wise, it's not healthy. I used to be this person that looked on stories and every day I was like, wow, I'm not invited to this brand trip. I'm not invited to this. I'm not invited. Why am I not invited? And also there's always a reason you're not invited. Um, so I try to not look really at anything else. And the designers that I know that I really admire, they also don't really look at other designers. They have no idea what's going on. So I think sometimes it's quite nice to be sheltered in this way. And um, I have no get ready to move with me on my TikTok. I have like mental health jokes. I have whatever I'm interested in that day. But I try to, yeah, I hope this makes sense dictate what my audience will want and not just like what do they want from me what do they want from me and I also when I see content creators that post on their stories like what do you want to see from me sorry this sounds like I'm a bitch but what do you want to see from me I always think like shouldn't you know or shouldn't you not care shouldn't you enjoy creating content so I try to yeah I, I try to just create content for myself but of course with the audience in mind but I think once you push over too much of like following what you think your audience audience wants, I think that's also a very quick spiral into not enjoying your job, not enjoying creating content, not enjoying being creative, not enjoying getting dressed, not enjoying anything. And I think that is, I'm so grateful to be here. And it's the biggest fear I think for any creative is to lose passion, right? To lose passion, passion about their job, to lose interest. And um, yeah, so yeah, I feel like now I really went off into a rant, but. I try to just think whoever is along for the ride, they will enjoy whatever content I put out there. And that's my strategy. Um, yeah. So now I've mentioned management a lot of times. I've had this talk yesterday with um, my boyfriend, actually, because I don't fully sometimes understand the difference between management and agent. Uh, which is why in my own podcast, I mix these up all the time. These are very separate jobs. Just my person does both. So I get it mixed up. So please do not listen to my descriptions of the job manager and agent because it's very different things. I think usually from my understanding, the manager is like 
out in the streets, taking meetings, knowing everyone, doing the socializing, introducing you to people, and the agent is in an office and doing the contract and getting you more money. My situation is kind of both in one. Honestly, I wouldn't even know if my agent calls himself agent or if he calls himself manager because I mix these up all the time. Um, I have been with my agency in Paris for three or four years. It was in the beginning of the pandemic and um, I did it by myself before. I did it myself. Um, a lot of people, which I didn't even know, I should have probably done that. A lot of people who don't have management, they have a fake email with a made up persona that is an assistant or a fake um, agent which I think is a really smart thing to do. I'm, I'm gonna talk about, I think I already mentioned this, but creating distance between you and the client is so important and so important for your mental health because they directly tell you what you're worth. And I am really glad that I never see this stuff. So if you have no one representing you and you're getting emails, I would honestly advise you to do the fake assistant email, you know, like here's Anna and I am representing blah, blah, blah. It's easier also to defend yourself when you're not talking from first person. I never did that, but I wish I did, honestly, because I would have gotten into a lot less fights, I'm assuming. Um, yeah, so I was, I did it myself and then I was looking for uh, management and I was interviewing with these different, you know, just like friends of friends, um, friends who are influencers who were like, oh, I, I have a contact at my agency. So I was in, interviewing with, um, yeah, talent agencies. And with every meeting, I was just like, oh, this is not what I want to do. Because they were always like, we love what you're doing, but you know, you know you're going to have to do this. But, you know, but already changing me within the, trying to change me within the first meeting. And it didn't feel right. And then um, at some point, I, post, I got a bit frustrated and I posted, posted it publicly, excuse me, on my Instagram stories. And someone reached out of uh, someone that I already followed and I really looked up to her and um, her boyfriend is the manager and we had two, three Zoom meetings because it was in lockdown and like I fell in love. It was someone, they both really understood where I was going instead of just like, we love you but you're gonna do this. Within the first meeting, and this is really three or four years ago, I was a lot smaller. I think I had, I already had like, 80,000 80, followers on Instagram, I would say, but you know, that's micro compared to everyone else. And they weren't re saying, we love you, but you're gonna do this. But they were like, do you wanna give lectures? Do you wanna curate uh, exhibitions? Do you wanna product design? Do you want this? Do you wanna bring out a book? Do you want, like they, ha they came with so many ideas and ideas first and money we figure out later because you can always, you know, That should never be the first thing. And it also worries me, I have to say, when I talk to influencers and everyone's talking about like, oh, I want to change agencies, I want to do this, when their first question is, how much commission do they take? Um, I'm like, Will I, do I let myself go into this rant? But I think, yes, I do. Commission obviously is a percentage of what you're making. Um, if, there is, if you're getting 100K for a job, the agency might, I mean, they really vary from model agencies. Maybe it's, it's 15, maybe it's 20, maybe it's 25. Um, if you are a superstar, I think these big Hollywood agencies, usually it's 10%, but if you are a superstar, you know, you're Brad Pitt and you're getting millions for a thing, maybe your agent will also get, only get like 3%, but I don't know this, don't quote me on anything. Um, and my commission is very high. It's also from two sides. It's from me and it's from the client. And um, I don't ever think about that number. I don't ever think about, quote unquote, the money that I'm losing or the money that I'm giving up. I think it's also, you, if you make a commitment with a management and they promise you things, then I trust them. I, don't, I think this is very glass half empty, thinking about the money that I'm losing. Um, when I see influencers, especially very successful influencers who do it themselves, the amount of time and effort and hassle and discussions they have, emails or phones. And if you follow big influencers and they post the, it's 3 a.m. And, and I'm still doing my emails. That is lifetime that I will never get back. And I give up a high percentage. And in return, I never have to worry about anything. I don't really have to work. I don't have to be in emails. I don't have to be in any meetings. I 
really can concentrate on what I'm doing and what I'm good at and I don't have any hassle and I feel really, really grateful. And also my agent or manager, I love them and I want them to be successful. And if you always think about like, what am I, what are they gaining from me? I don't think that's a healthy approach. So this number is never really in my head. Maybe this sounds like super delusional and maybe that sounds like if you're a business person, it sounds stupid to you. Like, oh my God, she's losing all this money. What a, <laughs> what a stupid girl. But I don't, I think my rates are, for me, they're really great and I'm making enough money and why wouldn't I give up a percentage for someone? So if you are talking to agencies or management and that is the whole discussion about how much money they're going to take from you instead of what can you do for me where I don't even think about this percentage that I'm giving, giving up. Yeah, I don't, I don't think this is healthy. I think it's like very small mindset. I think it's the opposite of abundance mindset. I think if you find a good agent or if you find a good manager, sorry that I'm mixing these things up, but you shouldn't have to worry about these things, you know? And I know that my manager believes in me and believes in what I'm doing. And that to me is worth a price. And it's also, you know, it's worth a price to me to not have an embarrassing management because that is really, I mean, the emails I get because I'm also an editor the emails I get to my author to see email with like the most cringiest managers pitching their talent, asking for covers, t asking for Brenda's business. And it's like a random influencer, but they're being like pitched as this crazy creative director because they've done one, I don't know, co-design of a commercial brand. Um, I'm, I feel very fortunate that I have the attract on chase management that will then turn these requests into much higher numbers. Um, I think that to me is worth a lot more. But yeah, my percentage I would say is pretty high, but um, I, I, I have nothing to worry about. So I'm really never in CC, clients can't reach me until there is a contract. I mean, I have an email obviously, but I just forward everything. I don't handle the requests. Um, I also don't open DMs, even if the DM would be from, I don't know, Gucci, but <laughs> just a random example. But I, if you are trying to get in contact with me as a brand, I don't really even see the, the Instagram DMs. They're for my followers if I choose to interact with them. But if it's whether that's gifting or paid job, if you ignore the management email, in my profile to me that's unprofessional you know trying to get access to me without going through the management and I know that some managements can be super exhausting but I pay that price for a reason you know to feel protected to have a buffer and I really only have contact with PRs that I like that I know personally that I've worked with for years but even then if it comes to jobs I don't discuss anything with them that all goes through my agent so even if it's the PR at, what would be like an example of a brand that I love? Even if it's the PR at Magella, of course, that would be my own phone number and texting and seeing each other. But if it were ever to come to a job, that is management. And I don't really have anyone, any negative besides the um, person not telling me I'm worth, telling me I'm worth more than gifting. And I think, I don't know which episode I talked about this. Um, besides that, I don't really have people pushing boundaries or disrespecting the, you know, the rule of talking to the management. But yeah, to me, I feel really protected. I never have to justify my prices and um, the management, of course, they tell me everyone that's reaching out, but often they also decide like, this is not, not n nothing for you, but everything is discussed between me and them. And then they get back to whatever the request is, I would say. So it's not just an agent, it's also management um, in terms of which client's good for you, which isn't, here's our opinions. And I think the job can get very isolating. And if you just have like an assistant or like yes men around you, you can get very, um, yeah, you can get, um, like diva characteristics and the management would also be honest to me. You know, you need this right now or you don't need this right now or your content's good, your content's bad. And um, yeah, so if there is a client, I just want to give like a real life example. 
there's a client booking me, um, then there will be a brief, right? Like do's and don'ts. Um, kind of like very obvious ones, you know? Imagine if I did a, what am I wearing? I'm wearing, if I, imagine I did a the row shoe activation and I'm wearing a J'adore Dior top. Like these are very obvious things, like no, no big brands in the background, no other brands in the background. Product has to be visible, but maybe sometimes it doesn't. So these briefs can be very, very different from each other. And um, you read the brief, then I don't send a concept, but usually um, influencers would, would send back a con concept, like here's what she's planning, here's what I am planning to do, or my management say, here's what she's planning to do. I don't really do that because I'm hyper specific. So if a brand books me, they kind of know what they're getting and they're booking me for me. Mm. And then I shoot the content and then I send it to my agent management and they send it over and they will also do pr pretty much everything in their power for that content to be approved for the client to not really get any edits because I listen to the brief and here's what you're getting. So I don't, nev so I don't ever have to tell the client like I really want this image but not this like we're sending what we're ready to post and my one thing from that I have for my management is the clients will always choose the images or content or video that you like the least so really make sure that you send over content that you're happy with because yeah they will always choose the one that you like the least um, that is one of the biggest things I learned and in hindsight to me it's like such an obvious thing but you know you send over maybe if a client booked a carousel like 10 images or 8 images or 6 images in, in an Instagram post and um, I would always say here's my cover photo and not let the brand choose because they will always choose the one that you like the least whether that's like the full on product view or I don't know. Um, so yeah that is how that works. I hope that's helpful. Um, if your question is how to find a management, mine found me very organically, but I think it's quite easy to stalk these things. I don't think I should be giving you like a big tutorial on this stuff, but if you figure out talents that are close to you, that you like content that you would be able to do, talents that are similar to you, maybe a little bit more successful, you would just, everyone has their talent email in on their bio, like you just not reach out to them directly, but you Google them, you go on the website, who else are they representing? Do your research. I think it's very easy to find um, to find management. Doesn't mean they are willing to take you, but finding out who represents who, I think it's relatively easy. But yeah, I would say most bigger people, unless I do everything themselves, they have a manager and then they also have an agent. And then some, if they're really big, they also have a publicist, right? Public relations, someone who gets you the interviews, someone who gets you the covers, someone who also sometimes helps with show requests. It really depends. Um, it depends on the person who's working for you. I do not have a publicist because I also don't really have any trouble with getting press. Um, usually a publicist also, they help you when you have like a film coming out or, or a project coming out. But for normal influencers, sometimes there also isn't anything newsworthy, right? Unless you're a founder, unless you're coming out with your Mango collaboration, unless there is newsworthy things. So I find sometimes the publicist also for influencers a little bit like, do you really need that, you know? And I get a lot of requests for interviews, but if I really don't have anything to say in this moment, like if there's not an angle, if there's not a story, I usually also decline because just here's Brenda <clears throat> for the sake of, oh my God, I swallowed something. Mm. A news article just to have like press clippings. I don't think that's worth it. So I don't have a publicist. I think this would come much, much, much later um, in line when, if I were ever to be a lot bigger than this in terms of platform or in terms of I have a brand which I'm not planning to do at this moment I just want to say I, there's no brand from my end but um, yeah publicist would be the person doing like media relations but also because I am an editor at a magazine I kind of would have these contacts myself already but yeah a publicist could also be beneficial for some people. Um, I also hope you know that a lot of influencers buy the coverage like you can buy a cover even you know sometimes 
I get emails of, I don't know if I can say, but I think to me it's quite obvious who is buying a cover and who isn't. You know, if it's like a sketchy um, license, I don't know, is it a lofty yell of like a really small country? Like these are usually bought. Um, digital covers can be bought. And if an influencer is, for example, posting stories about a shoot, for a magazine before the magazine is out, you pretty much know that this is a deal. Either they paid for it or the brand that they're wearing paid for it. You know, you, if I, I can talk about O32C here, they have the last call on whether or not someone is on the cover and which picture is on the cover. So no one would ever post cover shoot pre the magazine coming out because you never know what's gonna end up being on the cover. Like that is not a, if someone does that, that is not a real thing. If an influencer posts behind the scenes of a shoot for a magazine, that is probably a sign of not, not, it not being a legit magazine or publication because you don't post these things prior to anything coming out. That is creative freedom of the credible magazine, usually. Does that make sense? So a lot of these like cover moments, they are paid for. Doesn't mean they aren't still beneficial because for if you buy these, you know, a Belarus cover, a, I don't know, I've, I don't even know what these sketchy magazines are, but if you buy these, you know, some really commercial client or fast fashion brand, like some random, like, quote unquote, couture brand, they might find this attractive and pay you more because you are, quote unquote, a cover girl. So there is a lot of, like, business going on with media placements and also, I don't want to sound too shady here because there's also magazines, magazine covers you can buy with credible magazines, but it's more like um, Chanel paying for a cover of Vogue China. Not anymore, obviously the um, advertising money has gone down there really, but these kind of deals also exist, you know, so it doesn't mean everything automatically is like sketchy or shady. But when it comes to like influencer covers, I would usually say if an influencer posts quote unquote behind the scenes before the thing is even out, that is a sketchy deal. Um, yeah, so there's that. Um, for my, t my the moment, I um, do not see the benefit for me having a publicist. I don't think I'm like big enough for, for that kind of stuff. But media obviously um, brings you more value, right? Um, I, for example, Okay, how does my management calculate, quote unquote, my worth? Obviously, there's a bit of also supply and demand, right? That means we usually work with requests, like the brands coming to me and then working out money and not pitching. Um, when it is in my past, when it's been like slower months, um, I obviously get nervous and I'm writing or messaging my agent like, you should be reaching out, you should be pitching me. But in hindsight, like... Does that work? Yes, but you never really get the deals that you want. Um, so they work on a supply demand basis. Um, the more supply there is, we can charge higher numbers and we can say no to more things. Um, my worth. The most obvious thing is numbers, right? It's followers, um, it's platforms, it's, uh, um, I don't know if my blue check actually helps me with anything, but I have a quote unquote industry following. so. If a photographer or like anyone big in the industry clicks on my Instagram profile, I would assume that they see a few mutual friends, right? An industry following means um, magazines follow me or editors follow me or photographers follow me or models follow me, industry following. Um, my worth is also, that's, this also comes back to media, recognizability. So there might be... Um, Someone next to me at an event, like a 22-year-old TikToker that has like 20 million followers, but at the event itself, no one recognizes her, right? So her value derives from numbers, pushing sales, um, maybe crazy numbers online because the fans are like, oh my God, she's at this event. And my numbers are also a lot smaller, but my benefit here is I walk into an event and I know people and PRs. Of course, there's two sides of an event, the online numbers that you want, but you also want to create a vibe inside, inside of the tent, inside of the venue. So what's my example? Blake and I. Blake is my very good friend, the editor-in-chief of a magazine curated by. If, you know, we're like kind of like buddies usually because of social anxiety going into things, but Blake knows 
everyone in there. I might know 20%, but that's still a lot. So we enter the venue and we have people to talk to. And PRs, um, they don't want everyone to be quiet, like sitting, sitting in their chair, you know? They wanna create a vibe. They also wanna create a vibe for the cameras. You know, the live stream is already rolling before the show started. All of these things have worth, right? Me coming in and maybe being recognized by the BFA photographer and you see the flashing lights and someone turns around and they're like, wow, there's people that are known here. All of these things create value. And I remember uh, last year I got paid to go to a fashion week party and it was so important to the brand because I did another activation with them, but it was so important for the brand to have, like we want Brenda at the party. And then my management negotiated, like she's there a maximum of 30 minutes because you know I hate parties. I always want to have like a safety net of like, oh, maybe I want to go, maybe I have social anxiety. I ended up staying a lot longer, but over the course of maybe the two hours that I was there, a lot of people said hi to me in front of the PR. So I was standing with the PR of the brand that paid me to be there. And editors came up to me, someone from Vogue Italia came up to me, you know, people came up to me, a few um, followers also came up to me. And at the end of the night, the PR said to me, that is why we really wanted you here. You know, it is worth something to us that you're here. Other people see you here and they're like, oh, wow, Bre Brenda works with them, Brenda supports them. So there are, oh, I find it so cringe to talk about myself in this way, but you know, these are all different things that contribute to your worth. So that is, my worth is going into the fashion show and knowing people and the, uh, whether that's the front row, I'm sitting at the second row, I probably have someone to talk to, you know, I'm responsible for creating the little vibe of this universe of this brand event. And um, someone with 20 million followers who maybe comes with their management and doesn't talk to anyone, their worth is somewhere else. It's really big online numbers. But um, yeah, even within the venue, it's, there's work that no one from the outside or none of my followers see. I hope this makes sense. Um, yeah, recognizability. Then one of my worths is obviously authenticity. I think by now, every, a lot of people promote things that they don't believe in. And my unique selling point is promoting things that I love, promoting things that I, sorry, I sound so bored, but promoting things that I actually would buy. And that is my absolute no-go for working with anyone if this is not something I would buy myself. Um, you also buy image or exclusivity, you know, the roster of brands that I represent is very exclusive. It is luxury fashion usually, or it's something, a brand that doesn't work with anyone. So you have to pay to get into the club also. I hope this makes sense. Um, I, okay, conversion. Obviously, um, I would see myself usually as an image influencer, you know, bringing value via image. But if there is a perfect alignment with product, I can also convert. Whether that's, I don't know, a few weeks ago, I posted my Le Mer pants on my Instagram stories and I saw how many people bought it because it's like exactly that taste. It's kind of in a price point that people can afford. It's still super fucking expensive. But like if there's a perfect alignment of like perfect season, perfect product, perfect blah, 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 I also convert, but this like, I don't want to say the stars the stars have to be aligned because it's not so, so I don't want to make myself sound like it's rare that I convert sales but it has to be an alignment right and sometimes when a client is like we want image then we also want you to drive to um for people to download the app and then we also want sales and then we also want the product shot and if you're asking for too many deliverables storytelling wise it doesn't make sense and the fact that I have a quote unquote real job and an, another job really um, drives my worth. You know, I have my company called Disruptive Villain, which I'm kind of not going out of, but I'm doing less of that. I used to really sell vintage clothing. Now it acts more as a showroom. So I, people pay, brands pay to come see the archive and like borrow things and um, take pictures of things just because secondhand has been getting so much more expensive to me. It's not really worth the, doing it that much. I write for a print magazine that really, that is something that no one can buy, right? No one can just buy a title somewhere unless, honestly, these magazines whose covers you can buy as an influencer, they should make fake titles that you can buy. Business idea. Anyways, I write for print, so that really brings worth, you know, that I bring something to the table. I'm attached to this incredibly credible magazine with like crazy talented people on the masthead, amazing covers. So of course, because I'm attached to this universe, um, 
my price might be higher than someone with the same following as me that is quote unquote just an influencer. This is mean, meant in no shady way, this is just how it works. Um, that is also someone who is a musician, someone who's a photographer, someone, you know, there's all of these like different other jobs that you can do that um, contribute to your worth. Um, I have something to say that is, I think I mentioned earlier in the episode, some brands will just give you the caption to write. I don't work, I don't work in this way. I have something to say and my unique selling point is storytelling. Like I said, if there's like too many deliverables, like we want the product placement, we want the link, we want the this, then I'm often also saying like, it doesn't make sense for my audience. Like I can't sell five things at once. Um, I will be able to create a concept for the brand that's approaching me, right? And they should have the concept by themselves, but usually like I don't like it or it isn't fitting for me. So my worth is that my management and I take the request, we think about it, we have a meeting internally and we're like, what can I do to promote this in a way that is convincing, sounds like so fake, but in a way where also the storyline ends up because sometimes I see the pitches from brands and then she sails into the sunset with a product and you're just like, what are you like? No one gives like audiences are not stupid. Like sometimes it's better to just be honest or sometimes it's better to just say, here's the bag. Isn't that sick? Like I, yeah. So my worth is also, I work with a brief and we propose something and um, some influencer have no creative work. You know, they just have their friend or their boyfriend who's taking the picture and here it is and here's me with the bag. But like, I come with styling, I come with a whole outfit, I, I integrate your product into my life. That like all of these things are worth something. So storytelling is worth something, you know? There's a reason that copywriters exist. There's a reason someone, a brand is working with an advertising agency. So I think if you are a creative person, these things come to you quite naturally. And I think there's also amazing influencers out there, I do not count myself as one of them, that do mini campaigns for these brands, you know? that go above and beyond and hire their own photographer and take the brief and take it to the next level where it looks like a job that's much bigger than it is. And I have so much respect for that, where like the bag activation looks like, like its own fucking editorial. I don't really do that. Like I would say, and uh, yeah, it, dep it depends, but I don't usually do that just because of my own cringe mountain. And I'm really trying to do that more, more often. I, my photo shoot for the podcast announcement, for example, was one of these things, but I always cringe at myself because I don't want people to think like, oh my God, she thinks she's a model or oh my God. But yeah, that is one personal thing that I want to work on is also going above and beyond. And so far I've not done that or I've not pushed myself to do that, but that is on my um, personal like to-do list. Um, then there's also, it also sounds like I'm like so full of myself, but there's a taste level that I bring to the activations, you know? I have this whole, okay, you can't really see any of it, besides my um, Calder from, Alexander Calder from the museum shop of B Guggenheim. Um, I bring a taste level. So the background of my apartment is all vintage designer furniture. You know, my apartment's nice. I, like, I curate my entire life. And if you do a bag activation, if you are um, Gucci giving me a bag, I will have vintage Tom Ford Gucci to wear with it, you know? so. I have built up this whole, yeah, t t taste level, mood board. Um, my references are from 15 years of being a fashion and architecture and design nerd. Like I will be able to pull up a lot of different things to make an activation work. And that is all part of my um, worth. So if you ever, like I really think um, research Sometimes maybe you think that is wasted time, but I am on, whenever I have a free minute, I don't watch TikToks, I'm on Pinterest, scrolling, saving, saving into, saving for future jobs that I am not even really thinking about. But you know, at some point I want to do products, at some point I want to bring out a bag, at some point I want to do a shoe with someone, at some point I want to do jewelry with someone. I have my references ready, you know? So part of my job is always and that's not even like a duty, but it's my interest. You know, I'm fascinated by everything and I think research is so important. So my price is also that you pay for research I do in my free time. Like I will have a deck ready for you in a day because I love this stuff. Um, so you kind of pay for a taste level, whether you think that's good taste or bad taste, you know, taste is just taste. Doesn't mean, you know, I think I'm so great and I'm like um, 
a Kennedy Bassette, but you are, when you're requesting me, there's, I already come with a whole world of things that I can propose. Also, that can mean sometimes I'm not so flexible and I have to decline 80% of jobs because I am so OCD about my image, like I love aesthetics, that usually I'm just like, I, I, this, I cannot make this work, you know? Um, whether that's the, I don't know, the, I think in the last episode I mentioned declining a, my first gift from Prada because I really didn't think the bag was beautiful and I don't want to just make it work, you know? Make, I think 90% of jobs for influencers are making it work, making it look good, but I want products that already look good, you know? My own wish is that I get approached for really beautiful, well-made things that I don't have to make work, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, so <laughs> that is part of the strategy. I hope like all of these things make sense. And I think, I hope, I mean, A, that you see I'm willing to, you know, trade knowledge, but usually my biggest thing is that I have passion for all of these things. I have passion for products. I have passion for design. I love going to the shows. I love going to events. I also, even with a little bit of social anxiety, but I love socializing. And I think the biggest perk of my job is, maybe it sounds so cheesy, but all of the people I get to meet, you know, I usually the job of an influencer, what I'm seeing now, I don't have that many influencer friends, but the big girls, they're usually in contact with the PR and that's it. You know, but I, I, because of my magazine work and just because I'm social, you know, I get to be in contact with the photographers and with the stylist and with the front of house and with the strategies. Also, I'm not saying being in contact with the PR is bad, but you know, you, it's like as if I were only to speak with photographers or only to speak with my management, you know, I think everyone you meet has so much knowledge and is sitting on this pile of like inspiration. And that to me is really the biggest perk which is also why I think you always have to be aware of losing your passion because I think once that goes away, of course you can quote unquote make it work, but I think audiences now are so smart and then I always think, you know, strategy wise also, if I look at bigger profiles and um, I think, for example, a few years ago, people wanted the um, portfolio Instagram. And if I look at this now and every single post is an activation, I unfollow, I immediately get bored because I'm like, what are you actually interested in? What are you about? Um, yeah, so my main tip is, uh, it sounds, it's a really privileged thing, but right, doing what you love. And I think that will translate to audiences that, are you, that you are obsessed, that you are excited, that you, I don't know. And I think that is also the biggest seller is love. Um, yeah, anyways, I hope. This is kind of helpful to anyone, or at least it makes you understand my work better. I think in the next episodes, I can also go really in depth about my writing, how I got to be at the magazine, um, how I write, um, my consulting work, all other stuff. But yeah, I'm really happy to always talk, like be open about strategy. I think it's so fascinating. I always wanna know how other people talk to clients, how they're getting with clients, how they're losing with clients, what they're doing to keep themselves inspired, like all of these things. And um, I think one thing, I've had this discussion with so many of my friends in the last month and also because I, for the first time in my life, have an assistant. And um, if you're listening to this, I think she's listening to this, one of the things that I love about her is curiosity. And I think curiosity is something that you cannot teach. And um, I think, because she was not, when I was looking for an assistant, she, I, the last thing I wanted was like this a Rick Owens obsessed person, you know, because um, I needed help in like very different aspects of my career. And one time she was walking next to me and she w was telling me about the Magella documentary she just watched, you know, like an older thing. And I was like, oh my God, really? Like you cannot convince someone to be interested. And um, curiosity to me, um, I have a few things that keep my career going and I think it's passion, curiosity and adaptability because all of my different um, worlds, right, the writing, disruptive Berlin, consulting, influencing, they're not always the making money and time and passion, they're never aligned, you know, something I'm super passionate about, it makes me very little money and something I'm not so passionate about but it makes me a lot of money. So I, I think my biggest um, the thing I look back on where, where I'm like, oh my God, I'm so glad that I like spread myself 
out, you know, into different areas, into different job titles, into different, I don't know, because they all now work in this like, yeah, like a clockwork and they benefit each other. So I'm really happy that I am still adaptable to whether that's shifts in the industry or yeah. Um, and you know, it's also what if, if, I don't know, Instagram gets deleted tomorrow, I still have an income because I created the um, recognizability like on the street. It doesn't mean just because my social media is gone, I don't get recognized on the street. Like all of these different things. Yeah, I don't know. I love strategy. I hope this is helpful. Um, thank you for listening to Brand Awareness episode seven. I'm really glad that you're here and I hope you have a great week and a great summer and I hope you're doing well mentally and I hope um, that you reward yourself with some offline time. I've been, like yesterday I went to dinner with my boyfriend and he left his phone at home because he was, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but he was feeling like a little bit anxious and these things are so healthy and I hope you are able to take some time to yourself, whether that's a YouTube workout or a hot girl walk or a walk without a phone. Yeah, I hope you give yourself a breather and yeah, love you and always let me know what kind of questions you have. I'm happy to talk about anything ever. Um, okay, thank you for listening.